Thank you for being uh, with us uh, this afternoon. Um, first, a short introduction. Um, my name is Eric. I've been working uh, for Plan on an IWMS vendor. I will go into the subject later for 17 years now. Actually, so I'm in the business of real estate and FM for approximately 17 years. We are working a lot with international um, organizations around facility management, one of them being the, the um, IFMA Foundation, which is largely around developing the, the infrastructure for training and education in this business worldwide. Um, so, um, first of all, a very short introduction of Planon. We are what you would say is an IWMS vendor. IWMS is for Integrated Workplace Management. I always say that is typically CAFM, adding to that portfolio management on the real estate side and sustainability kind of solutions on the other end. Um, so for us, key to what we try to do as a company is workplace, workplace and asset management actually. So we're being recognized by Gartner as one of the leading vendors in the world um, for seven consecutive years now. Uh, so we, are, we, we typically have a very uh, nice position there, having in excess to 620 people working worldwide. Um, so a little into uh, what we do uh, to the far end, uh, to your left, real estate, space and workplace management, maintenance of course, uh, integrated services and sustainability. So we look basically in our product, we look throughout the full life cycle of buildings and all the services uh, that take place in those buildings throughout their life cycle. Um, we work for very nice, oh, Kofali, by the way, that's old, it's now called Angie. <laughs> oh, that was nowhere, huh? I didn't get that one. Uh, so we have a, uh, an international profile, we're very accustomed to doing international rollouts with uh, customers of ours, of course we already also have uh, uh, companies and, and organizations that work in one uh, country only. So what we're going to talk about today is basically the role of technology and how it might impact uh, buildings as we as we SFM and real estate people are putting on the ground and operating um, and I would like to talk about why very very important so we can talk about oh IOT is coming and you can do a lot of things the question is why would we do it and why would these things are going to be happening so <coughs> Gartner calls it digital business interesting uh, that Gartner um, I don't know if you are a client of Gartner, Carol Roswell is one of their analysts. Uh, they are really uh, getting into the theme of workplace. They call it digital workplace. Uh, having other aspects to it, of course, than just the fiscal one that we are dealing with. Um, but uh, their interest is really significant in our view in, in predicting some of the developments that we will be seeing around the workplace also influencing our business. Um, they say a digital workplace enables more new and more effective ways of working, improves employee engagement and agility, and exploits consumer-oriented styles and technologies. And that's very interesting. So basically what they say is what we are experiencing in our private lives in terms of the goodies of technologies, trying to get that into the workplace is one of their statements. So, when we talk about future, what do we see as basic trends of, of buildings of the future? And there's basically two. One is virtualization, which we will come to, and the second one is Internet of Things. <coughs> I will explain both aspects. But first, whatever we're going to do with technology, it is about perspective. So what's important to me might be, not be important to you. And the kind of business that you drive will probably define what kind of technology app appliances are going to be interesting for you or not. Things are not the same. There's no one silver bullet in terms of technologies that we can put into buildings to make all great things happen. So that's going to be even a, a difficult part because there's going to be a lot of technology around to choose from. Setting the goal. Two years ago, Alexi Marmot, who is a professor at UCL, so she's doing architecture and FM uh, as a professor. professor. Um, she came with this slide at the um, Workplace Strategy Summit, also here in London. And what she said is, when you're spending a factor one on creating a building, 
that was based on research in the Western economies, by the way, you're probably going to spend one and a half on operating that same building over its life cycle. We are going to spend 15 in terms of salaries of people working there. So I took this slide, which was really an eye-opener to me, and I took it to one of our financial customers, a bank, and I said, would it be fair to say that if you spend 15 on salary, that you're creating somewhat in excess of 20 in business value? And they said, well, it's a prox, right? A little high, perhaps, but that would be right. So, in addressing why, what we do, and that's my observation at least, as a facility manager and real estate people, we are looking at 1 and 1.5, creating financial business cases, for example, for agile working or new world of work, where we're going to shrink our footprint, say, okay, we're going to lose so many sites or leases, which is a great value and a business case that you can show to the, C to the CFO. At the other hand, when we are losing 1% of productivity, however defined productivity, we're throwing out money out of the window, big time. There's one upside to this, no one tracks it, so it's not a problem. <laughs> That's good. Um, but still, if you go to 15 to 20, there's the factor of productivity. So the thing in our mind is, What's the most important? Of course, we're going to show business cases on the one and one and a half. But the real strategy for real estate and FM lies in the 15 to 20 factors. So how are we dealing with people who are using our facilities and what do we have to provide them in order to be successful? And I really think uh, we should have more conversations on that side and not to the left. This is probably why you buy us, the left, not the right side. The question is, is the right side or the left side? Um, so what Gardner states in terms of applying technology to workplace and in general to processes itself, and this is a, quite a shocking thing, by 2018, those businesses who have applied new technologies will require 50% fewer business process workers. In FM, I would say that 50% falls under that category minimally. So there's a huge um, potential in being more efficient by applying the kind of technologies that we are talking about being available in the market today. If you're a service provider and you're working against a single digit margin, that's the kind of business um, we are addressing here. So let's go to virtualization. You probably recognize this uh, picture, of course. Um, the first thing, we can hardly go away from it in the UK, and that's BIM. BIM is being a topic um, now for many years. I th personally, I see a lot of cautions there as well. It's not that easy to get it done. Um, and the government now has uh, put out this level three building information modeling strategic plan being directed towards the industry uh, with the goal to make the industry one of the top performers in the market worldwide. And this is actually one of the elements of virtualization. I see some potential for BIM in terms of what uh, General Electric calls digital twins. So you have this virtual representation of a physical thing that's really happening. I mean, you can cluster information on actual behavior on that virtual thing. You have a completely different type of perspective and a way that you can monitor operations than we did before. But this is not going to be easy. I can talk about it all day, but the thing is, what's the promise of BIM in terms of efficiency? When you look at the standard processes like we used to do, you had with each stage each handover stage, you would lose a lot of information. Information that you had to recover. And the biggest one, no surprise, is that effective handover of the building to the life cycle people. I guess you can relate to that. So, while the BIM process really promises a more gradual and better managed information profile about the building, 
we can ask ourselves in the future when you get a new building, is it just the stones that you're going to receive or, or also require a model that eloquently describes what you're going to get as part of the definition of building. <coughs> we are concentrating on this great gap that you have between a BIM build model being delivered and effectively being able to use that information in your daily operations. Another thing, because we were talking this morning, we had a, a talk about um, meetings and I heard, oh, I'm Skyping a lot with my colleagues and so on. <coughs> we think there's something very interesting going on in terms of virtual meetings. And uh, what we see happening when we meet, why are you here? Because you can act effectively interact with people <coughs> in a very close way. You can see and feel and whatever, smell and whatever. All your sensors are really engaged in, in the interaction. That's why we travel. I took a plane to be here in front of you in a physical way. So this is the highest, probably the highest quality of interaction that we can because we engaged all our sensors in this. And this is not scientific, this is our statement. The experience of an interaction and the quality or level of information exchange is driven by the number of human sensors engaged and the richness of their engagement. And I, I'm trying, I will try to, um, to explain what I mean by a very, very short video um, that is being shown. Sir, I probably have to ask you to start the video on my laptop if you can. So could you please do that? Yeah. The sound is uh, not there. So what you just saw, this is a, a, a normal gym. And what this company does which is being acquired by Google for $500 million last year, is create a real life experience of some, something that's not there. And this is the type of technology uh, that is really today hitting the market. This comes from the Microsoft website, uh, which is HoloLens. And this is about meetings. The question is, so what does it do? It just does speech and your view, 3D, from 2D to 3D, and you have a completely different experience. What we think this is moving towards is at least partially um, replacing physical engagements. So less travel, less pollution, less cost, less time waste, and stuff like that. The question is, as a facility management profession, are we really planning for this? Are we engaging all those that are among, around the building in order to create a joint strate strategy towards this. And it's almost there, it's, it will be there very soon. Interesting part from an FM perspective, if you're talking about virtual meetings, you're by default talking about multi-location meetings. So the meeting takes place in multiple locations at the same time in order to get people connected where you can have different types of services in location A and 2, B. So this is partly also changing the way we should think about things that we call reservations or services in meetings. And that's the virtuality that drives it. So in, type, in, in terms of space typing, perhaps we will see a new, new type of space because these experiences need design, need space design. It's not the same thing. You can't just put it in a room and it will work. You will have to design the space in order to have the experience happening. And this is something new because we're, we should be planning for that. So, this of course, can you see it? This is a guy who's there. The lady on the other, on the other side is not there. She's miles away. That's it on virtual. Uh, let's go to the Internet of Things. Everyone talks about Internet of Things. It's going to change the world. It probably will. Um, we have been uh, putting out, I've been writing an article on FMJ uh, about the sub subject. I called it the quantified building. And I did it on purpose because everything, we always talk about smart. 
smart meters and smart, and I, I'm lost in the definition of smart. But what we do, actually what we see happening when we're applying principles of IoT, is quantifying behavior, describing it. And, uh, <coughs> and that's not just about measuring things, it's about creating new types of interactions that we did not do before, we were not able to achieve before. And we'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> we have been, this is, we are currently in the second generation of IoT kind of technologies. So the first versions, and some of, them, of you in the room, I'm sure, have experienced how hard it was to get it done. It seems so easy. You put some sensors, you put them in the room, you're going to measure whether there's someone or not. That's horrible. It's not easy at all. And so we have been struggling a lot. But that's natural. That belongs to the subject of innovation and you need to fail before you can be successful. So we learned a lot from that as well. And <clears throat> that's why we drive our current developments by these values. And it's not just for nothing, because we know if we're not going to do it simple, scalable, secure and fast, uh, our customers will not be able to deploy and adopt it. And we would have done it for nothing. So, let's go to the problem. So we're doing this new world of work stuff. We're going to lose our, our footprint, partly. And we're going to put people and have them share something that would pr be pre previously be their own. So this is basically invoking new types of problems that we did not see before. If you're going to cram a lot of people into one building, they're going to look for a space to go to. Uh, they have, uh, they, there's noise problem, problems, of course. Um, perhaps even climatic issues. I have here this sensor. And we're playing around with all kinds of stuff. And this is a sensor who's measuring air quality in five or six parameters, from dust to CO2 to temperature, humidity, and stuff like that. What it does is green is okay, and it goes to orange, then it goes to red. So I had a personal experience there uh, when we were preparing a meeting in America. We just put it up for fun. And after half an hour, it became orange, and then it became red. And what we did is open the door. Uh, because being fed back with the actuals of your environment will change your behavior. And if we don't have to program that, then people will choose how to deal with that themselves. So the thing here is, if you put more people into one facility, you're going to create frictions. And one of the elements of diminishing that problem of friction is providing information. So if there's a, a little... Uh, if there's a, when I'm looking for a workplace to concentrate and I can get it from the building because the building informs me about its, its options and, uh, and so on, I'm, I'm feeling less of a friction than when I have to visit three floors in, or, in order to look for a space. Think about the, the waste in time. Again, factor 15. Health, well-being, we had, we had a great session on our cognitive, the brain, how the brain works. Um, it is still a big problem. Um, very simple, for me, very simple question is um, CO2 levels. There is research out there that prove that the brain does not work well under high CO2 levels. So, but we don't know how our buildings really operate in that respect. So we are, we are now engaging some research with uh, some Dutch institutes in order to discover what the real, the real uh, relationships are. And so if you can monitor that as a manager, you can at least uh, manage some of that. So the idea is uh, Ubering workplaces. It's very simple. I'm looking for this or that. Tell me what's the closest. Buy. And it's, that's simple. That's just it. You're not trying, if you're going to censor workspaces and, and, and indiv individual workplaces, you're just trying to inform your customers, your users, of what's available to them so they can choose. This um, service call is a very short movie. I would like you to pay some attention to what's happening. Hello. 
of altitude before having completed that, that full sequence, so I had to bail out. I've always thought that it's sometimes difficult, sometimes easy to make an ejection decision. What are we looking at? Any one of you? Yes, but before that, something else happened. The device was failing. We're looking at a failing device. In the, the aero, in the aero industry, they go to great lengths to make sure this doesn't happen. And if it happens, you see them investing big time in mitigating the consequence. So, sometimes I ask myself within our industry, because whenever I go into a communication or a session with a potential client, one of the first things they ask is, do you have service calls? Service calls is something that only happens when it's done, it's broke. So then we go into help desk, we're going to alarm people because we're in a must-do position. We have no manage managerial space anymore. We're going to do resource planning of people running around to mend the stuff. Uh, because, um, so we need mobile for that and we have an SLA. And the question is, is this, a, is this a, an exception or do we regard this as a practice? as normal, desirable behavior. If you look at the cost of failure vertical against the state of an asset, you will see that the costs are rising. First it operates well, then it degrades a little bit, more energy into it, whatever cost, and then it fails and then you're in the max cost position because this is going to be very expensive. You can even put out an SLA to your service provider, but you're going to pay for that anyway. So, this is one of the fields we think that IoT has some value to bring. There are now technologies available today that will enable you to track the dynamic behavior of assets and have warnings like your own car. Go to the garage within 2,000 miles. That's in time. That gives me space in order to identify things that are probably going to fail and make sure you can manage before it actually happens. And this is efficiency and non-stop operations, which is a, an experience element. So I was, I have to, oh, I don't have much time anymore. So what we say is we can do IoT in all types of areas around buildings. You can do it on how much capacity do you still have, the experience of people, are they happy? So you can put out a questionnaire, but you can also, for example, have push buttons. Did you like uh, the bathroom as in its current state? Yes, I liked it or not. Very short is the coffee machine. Uh, do, do you need service on the coffee machine? Just a knob, press once. So we're going to see new types of interaction of people in the workplace and within the building that will give us information that we can really act upon. So that's experience. Uh, of course, climate. So the health stuff I was being talking about, consumption of course, so what are uh, energy profiles and condition. So what I was just talking about, can we track actual behavior of assets? So when you go to crossovers, it's going to be even more interesting. Um, for example, here you see an example of uh, available spaces, but what I, what I did, just a mock-up of course, gave the information that these types of information uh, devices can give you in terms of how healthy is it in there. And when I'm looking for space, what would I choose? The one uh, available where just uh, probably was just a meeting and it's completely hot or CO2 or whatever, or the green ones? I will go for the green ones. So helping your customers around. If I track it, I know where my facility is probably inadequate to handle with the pressures of actual uh, occupancy as happening. <coughs> Something else, another interesting, is actual use and condition. So uh, we would call that um, activity-based cleaning or use-based cleaning. So not going through the whole building, but just prioritize on those areas that have been used the most. Another one is we had some customers who had really had, you can, uh, and energy waste throughout the weekend, for example. So buildings were being heated or cooled or whatever, no one was in them. So that will point you to potential areas 
where you can improve uh, efficiencies and save money. This one is very uh, funny. You, you should get one of those from Interface. Plants, you would say, this is what you see here. This is our research area. We are sticking in a sensor into the pot of the plant. You would say, well, what's that? We are monitoring whether they should have nurturing or water. So you're not just making rounds every so much time and 20% or 10% is dying anyway, but you can really track and say, okay, this location and that location needs feeding. I have an example where a service provider lost 16,000 euros over one plant dying under an APPP project. So that's a, again, it's perspective. Sometimes it's going to be expensive, sometimes not. Smart. So let's shortly talk about smart. So what we see happening now is first, we are trying to connect sensors and kind of informational devices that will tell you how things really work. Then we are going to do the kind of processing I've been talking about, which will create reactions from systems that make sense. A no-show situation is a reservation and no one shows into the room. You can cancel it and put it available. That's very simple. Gartner calls smart like learning, the ability to learn. The system is learning itself. Think about the 50%. That's the kind of technology we're talking about today, also being, uh, re uh, being referred to as deep neural networks. Forget it. It's a technology, it's out there today. Enabling us to, le to learn from a lot of data. And that's what we think the future is about, because these buildings are going to be equipped with all kinds of sensors, <coughs> explaining their behavior, and then you're going to put it together and learn. But that's smart. The other, is, the other thing is quantified and connected. A smart meter doesn't exist for me because it doesn't learn. So <coughs> often um, if we look uh, to this, we look at what's happening in the B2B market. This is a picture from 1950, approx, talking about autonomous driving that we're talking about today. Cameras, one simple example. There are cameras out there being used in cars who do autonomous driving almost, which not only capture the images, but also describe what they see in it. So they can name the brand of the car that's there. And they see it's a biker and so on. That's the kind of thing you need for a car to address itself to the situation. And this smartness is built into a chip. And Gartner predicts this chip will be $30. So this camera can go into your building and you can recognize the people who are getting in there because it already is showing that computer systems like Google have better capability of facial recognition than we as persons. It's more reliable than we. So this is of course all going to be rising all kinds of privacy questions and things about it. But this is the things that you can basically do tomorrow. We don't as yet address to it. And I think it's going to be very important because we are going to see this paradigm shift in how we are going to work with data and learn from data. That's the thing that's going to happen in the future. For us, um, that's why we say IWMS. Um, is a completely new element of integration. First, we we've always thought about functional integration. Now we see the integration of things and describe, describing their actual behaviors and doing sensible things with it. That's basically the thing uh, that we see happening. So, all very complex. So sometimes things don't have to be very uh, complex. Um, this is uh, a great quote from Diane Coles, a friend of mine who is in the board of directors of IF IFMA. What you see here is this young woman here is talking to another young woman there. And this is what they call a porthole. The young woman on the other side is a few thousand miles away. 
So if you talk about connecting and connecting people and what we can do as an FM in order to create connections between people in, in, in a company that has multiple sites, this is only requiring a screen, a microphone, a camera and a data line. It's nothing. It's probably in the area of a coffee machine. And this is how we really, in very simple ways, can make connections and virtual connections with other sites and, uh, and have some engagement and excitement with our people that we work for. So, with that, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know, of course. If you want to have the article, you come up to me, give me your information, I'll send it to you. No questions? Oh, you have. Uh, yeah, hi there. Um, I was just wondering, I'm, well, I'm relatively new in the FM space, so apologies, it may be a, an ignorant question. But from what I've seen so far, it looks like lots of these things are done in terms of um, introducing new technologies, but in quite a fragmented way. Yes. Right, this, very, this, there's nothing ignorant about it. It's very important because this, this is going to be one of the problems. Um, because if you go to the internet, for example, you have uh, these manufacturers of uh, elevators. They are creating their own cloud services, monitoring the operations of their elevators. You have escalator manufacturers doing the same. You have coffee ma machine makers doing the same. So we are going to end up with all these great, in itself great kind of solutions which are helping you on that element. But your building is full of them. And that's what we call cloud brokering. And there we see, we see as a company, we see the role of an IWMS in connecting to all these kinds of solutions, but bringing them to one informational platform. So, relieving our customers from the concern, okay, where does it come from? Or, uh, I'm, I'm having another vendor in building A than in building B. Or, I don't have anything in building B, and so on, that kind of questions. So, that's what we say, this is what, what we say, this is new kinds of um, um, purpose for the CAFM and IWMS systems of the future to manage that in, in, on behalf of our customers. It's, it's actually, it's going to be horrible. Yeah, it will be horrible, horrible. Because there's so much around. In, in a few years from now, there will be thousands of suppliers of smart <coughs> with connected technology that are going to approach you to do it with their coffee machine, their cleaners or whatever, you know? So how to manage that? For an advisor from my side would be team up with your IT people. It's going to be very important. And by the way, in, in terms of IoT networking, there's going to be a complete new kind of technology out there. If you're interested, um, you could look at it. Um, I mentioned it, I think, here. Laura, to the right, to the left. This is the type of technology that you, basically the advantages there of that new, this is not IP technology, not the normal networking technology that you know today. But this is a type of technology where you need one access point in a building and regardless of how many floors you have, you will be able to connect devices to that network and it will connect, con uh, communicate to that one access point. So you need one access point, you just hang the things in the, in the room and they will, co will communicate. So you don't need Wi-Fi access points all over the place in order to have coverage. These kinds of network to technologies have a standard reach of 15 kilometers. And they're using it in smart cities. So we bring it to the building. Very logical. And that's simple. And it's cheap. Yes. Yeah. Can you get sensors to plug into people so that you can predict um, behavior? Yeah, perhaps we could, but I'd rather not. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I, my, my words to sum that up again, those of you who like science fiction, is 
Delegate. That's what we'd like to hear at the end. Let's say thank you very much.